Well, thank you, distinguished presidents, and, and thank you, Bill. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today. Uh, the genesis of my invitation to come here was actually Mike Pinto and I were up in the Sierras at this lovely place called Wright's Lake um, more than a year ago, and it was um, before I was even elected president of the National Academy, so um, what I would be doing today uh, wasn't even, in, in terms of my job, wasn't even on my horizon. And so he said, wouldn't you like to come to Monterey and speak to a group of oceanographers, um, ocean engineers, all of your old friends. I said, sure, that sounds like a great idea. I'd love to do that. Um, not knowing at the time, of course, the logistics involved in that, um, given that I, I've sandwiched this meeting in between meetings in Oxford and in Paris. Um, it is the, the 350th anniversary of the French Academy of Sciences that I'll be going to next, and uh, a big to-do at Oxford that I just came from but um, I really wouldn't have missed this for anything because the, this certainly is, is my home community and uh, I'm happy to speak with you. So uh, I'm, I'm guessing that uh, many of you here in this audience um, have had um, from anywhere from zero to only a passing uh, intersection with the National Academies of Science and so I wanted to take a few minutes of time this morning to tell you a little bit more about the National Academies because this is the first time in history, to my knowledge, that someone with deep ocean roots has actually led the National Academy of Science. And so for all of you in this community, this is your chance to have your person running what is actually a fairly influential organization. So, I'm, I'm your insider, and I want you to take advantage of this to think about what you want as your agenda for not only the nation, but also the world, because the National Academy has connections to other academies worldwide, and we can actually work nationally and globally to get uh, issues of high importance on the agenda. So let me tell you a little bit about the National Academy. Well, the National Academy actually has an ocean origin, and many people don't know that. It began with the battle of the first two ironclad warships, the Monitor, the USS Monitor, and the Confederate ship the Merrimack, which is actually more uh, correctly known as the Virginia. It was the Merrimack's hull that was covered in iron to become the Confederate ship, the Virginia. And the battle of these two ironclads was uh, a turning point in naval history. They uh, fired at each other, um, it was the um, uh, Battle of Hampton Roads, and neither could penetrate the other's armor. At that time, both the British Navy and the French Navy had uh, ships, uh, warships that they were building that were made of wood, and they halted instantly those shipbuilding um, operations and immediately switched to uh, iron ships because they knew that the entire era of wooden warships was over after that uh, Battle of Hampton Roads. But also, from the scientific standpoint, Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln, who was our president, observed that battle, and he knew that the design of these ships was designed by scientists and naval engineers, and he wanted the scientists on his side. So as Congress was going into recess on midnight, on the last day of Congress, he got a bill through Congress to establish the National Academy of Sciences that would forever after co-opt the scientists of the country 
to be working for the government whenever the government asked. Now, these scientists would not be government employees, and the National Academy is not a government agency. It is a uh, extra government body that elects its own members, but we provide advice to the White House, to Congress, to any government agencies when asked, and the government pays us for that advice. So um, that's the origin of the National Academy. So what kind of influence has um, the National Academy had over the years? Well, important things, like um, you heard from Bill that I was the director of the U.S. Geological Survey. The fact that the USGS exists to provide uh, information to Americans on water, on climate change, on mapping, on uh, minerals, on energy, is the fact that a National Academy report recommended the establishment of the USGS. They recommended the establishment of the National Park Service. How many of you came here to this meeting in an airplane? Okay. Now, how many of you remember these days when those airplanes were filled with smoke? Okay, I remember those days. I'm old enough to remember those days. Well, it was actually a 1986 very influential report of the National Academy that recommended that smoke be banned in airplanes. But the tricky part of that report was they also noted that it was the tar and nicotine in cigarettes that was plugging pinhole defects in the passenger cabin and keeping those cabins at pressure at altitude. And so they had to improve quality control in the passenger cabins, otherwise they were gonna lose pressure once they banned smoking. So it led to smoke-free flights. In addition, it identified AIDS as a public health crisis. This wasn't just an issue that was affecting narrow populations, it was gonna to grow to a public health crisis long before people really understood what AIDS was. A National Academy report recommended a national program to sequence the human genome. And of course, that has led to incredible um, cascading um, effects in terms of understanding uh, who we are, where we came from, and how to treat various genetically linked diseases. And of course, um, another very influential report uh, in 2007 provided evidence that led to Congress passing laws that improved the CAFE standards for fuel economy in uh, vehicles, and it is probably questionable whether the auto industry would have pushed for that on its own. Now, there were also a number of uh, Academy reports that affected the oceans community directly. For example, in 1982, the Academy um, produced a report on options for scientific ocean drilling. At that point, DSDP, the Deep Sea Drilling Program, was coming to a close. And uh, there were several options. One was just say, good job, fellas, that's it. Uh, another option was continue on with the program as it was. But this Academy report said, no, let's up the ante. It went from deep sea drilling program to the ocean drilling program, which was a truly international program and engaged many international collaborators. Um, the Joides Resolution was replaced with the Glomar Challenger. It went on to do 110 worldwide expeditions and 2,000 drill holes, which changed our view of uh, global climate, of Earth history, and uh, led to many other startling discoveries. Another influential report is this one, From Monsoons to Microbes. Uh, this was a workshop report. It wasn't a consensus report. It was just a, a bunch of people who met over like two days. And it made the case that ocean health 
is intimately connected to public health, and it made climate impacts in the ocean a global health risk. So it meant all sorts of new stakeholders would suddenly be interested in the fact that we are changing the health of the oceans through what we are doing with climate change. Another workshop that I personally attended, and I think many of you in the audience did, uh, was a workshop that laid uh, this one, Ocean Research in the 21st Century, Implementation of a Network of Ocean Observatories. This was in 2003 down in um, Key West, I think it was. Um, it's amazing to go through this uh, workshop report, um, you know, more than um, uh, a decade later and see uh, what we've accomplished that exactly followed the blueprint from what was uh, a several day workshop. It, it uh, said we should have global, regional, and coastal elements to this um, uh, observing system. We should build test beds first. We should include outreach as part of the um, uh, OOI. It said uh, we have to invest in sensors, otherwise just wood in the infrastructure would not be sufficient, and that data management should be an integral part of the uh, observatory's initiative. Most recently, there was an Ocean Sciences Decadal Survey, uh, and this was uh, triggered by a looming budget crisis. There was a collision of too many infrastructural programs that were threatening to squeeze out the capacity to support individual PIs. And so the committee was charged with crafting a solution that would allow small PI programs in the ocean sciences to continue to flourish in an era of big science. Now I was asked to talk about what, what my view is of important things for the future. So let me take my last few minutes just to talk about that. One is, I'm a really bullish about robotics. Um, so much so that one of the um, most important legacies I believe that I left at Science Magazine when I was editor in chief was to start a new journal called Science Robotics, which will be publishing its uh, first issue in um, November. Um, and it's now accepting papers, and we'd love to get more papers from the ocean community. Science Robotics is going to be a showplace for top, um, really uh, world-class and um, uh, game-changing papers from all aspects of robotics, whether they be space robotics, ocean robotics, medical robotics, um, service robotics, industrial robotics, so that all of these communities have one place to come where they can learn from each other. And I believe that the oceans have a lot to contribute to this because in many of these communities, they're kind of late to the game. Take the service industry. Uh, to date, much of the care of the elderly has been done by humans because um, it was possible to do it with humans. But if you go to a country like Japan, where their age pyramid is going from something like this to something like this, will there be more elderly than there are young workers to take care of them? They view robotics as their only way that they're going to be able to care for the many aging people in their population. So they have to move quickly to get into um, uh, many of the very difficult aspects of robotics. Otherwise, they're not going to have enough workers to deal with other aspects of their economy and care for their elderly. Whereas in the oceans, we've known for decades that robotics is the only way we can get many of our tasks done because of the very difficult environments that we work in. Now, I'm on the, even though I've left science now, I'm still on the advisory board for this, and Jim Bellingham is on the um, editorial board, and um, either of us would be happy to talk to you about the sorts of papers we would love to see in this new journal. But I think this is not only a frontier 
for our oceans community, but this is an area where oceans has much to contribute to the economy, to society in general. Another area that I'm very bullish about is this one, ocean prediction. Understanding the connections between ocean, atmosphere, land, and the cryosphere. Putting together the next generation predictions on seasonal and multi-annual time scales. Everyone is interested in this, whether they're farmers, whether they're city planners, whether they're worried about uh, long-term uh, water supplies, whether they're worried about um, prices of commodities, shipping in the Great Lakes, anything. Everyone wants to understand long-term projections. Forecasting events of significance, such as floods, droughts, El Ninos. Longer-term projections on more than just seasonal time scales. This is going to be a very, very important area, and um, I believe that uh, we are on the threshold of being able to, to do this, to understand how events that are happening now in the Agulhas Current are going to be able to uh, determine future events in uh, the Indian Ocean, for example. Um, and then uh, another area I wanted to talk about is, um, this is just one example, the climate clearinghouse. Uh, I think that we as uh, ocean scientists need to get more involved in uh, policy. And I think we need to encourage more of our students and postdocs uh, to engage through uh, fellowships on Capitol Hill. Um, wouldn't it be wonderful if every oceanographic institution sent um, once a decade one of their best and brightest to run for Congress? Imagine how different it would be. Um, when I go to uh, nations like China um, or um, other countries where I see that they have, or Germany is a great example. I had breakfast with um, uh, the Germans. They actually have scientists in government. And the level of conversation that you have with their leadership is on such a different plane when they have scientists in government. We need to encourage more of our students to be doing things like that. Um, but I had uh, an interesting conversation with a group called the Climate Clearinghouse. It was started by Ed Markey, uh, the senator from Massachusetts. Um, Sheldon Whitehouse from Rhode Island is another um, strong uh, supporter of it. And these are informal conversations that people in Washington can have with uh, leaders who care about climate. Um, I was talking to them about a study that the Academy did on, um, for California, Oregon, and Washington, for those three states, on sea level. And the three states recognized that they have sev uh, similar sea level rise issues, and they wanted to be prepared by having the Academy do uh, a consensus study on what was the future like for sea level rise along the Pacific coast. And when I told them about this study, they got so excited, and they said, we need a study like this for the entire country. Because they didn't know, for example, and these are, Cong these are senators who really get it and who are really smart. They didn't know about the dynamic sea level effects. And as temperature changes between land and ocean, that the dynamic effects of the ocean can be as large as the eustatic sea level rise. Or that um, effects of sedimentation uh, coming into the ocean and, and how you actually manage dams and seawalls and things like that can have as large effects as eustatic sea level rise. They felt this was so important to understand on a local and regional level. And Sheldon Whitehouse said something very important that all of you need to remember in your conversations with the public. He said, the climate skeptics always go after the land measurements. He said they never go after the ocean measurements. They never have any answer to ocean acidification and the ocean temperature measurements 
because he said those effects are so large and he said they are so uncontaminated by, you know, heat island effects and things like that. So he said it's so important for the ocean community to be front and center in talking about climate change. And then I finally wanted to end with this. Um, the Academy is often asked to provide advice on senior political leaders. And it's, uh, that's why it's so important that we have a positive working relationship between the Academy and the uh, appointees. It provides an excellent avenue of communication for the academic community. So regardless of what happens this November, we will work to have a positive relationship with everyone in the administration. And I just put in here this little picture. Um, I'm, I know that some of you were at the State Department um, uh, convocation uh, last week on the oceans, and this was out in front of the State Department. It is a parrotfish created entirely of trash that was pulled off beaches by people who were cleaning plastic off the beach. And this is the sort of thing that John Kerry and Von Tarikian, his science advisor, put together because people in the top administration of this administration care about the oceans, they get it, and they want people to be inspired to do things to protect the ocean, to care about the ocean, and to understand the ocean. So thank you very much.